So hi everybody, I'm Scott Stanchfield and we're going to talk today about the Model View Controller Pattern. This is session three in the Design Pattern Series. We're going to do it every month on the third Thursday, I think is what it is. Uh, so same room, same place, all that type of fun stuff. Um, if you're interested in looking at the videos for these afterwards, you can take a look at http colon slash slash javadude.com slash articles slash patterns. And if you have any questions for me, you can contact me at scott at javadude.com or here at APL, scott.stanchfield at j do. So, hello, are you going to work? There we go. Blank screen. I like I'm starting with a blank screen. Now, the whole idea of the model view controller pattern is to give you some separation between your user interface and your model, your data, your manipulation of your data. When we talked in the first session, I don't know, was anybody here in the first session? No, has anybody seen the video for the first session? So you may want to go back and review that. I talked about a really naive GUI for a to-do list. And what we took, did was we took that example, and it was all kind of balled together. Everything was wound up such that the model was actually part of the GUI. You stored the data inside the GUI components, and the GUI components all talked to each other. It was a big mess. The model view controller is trying to separate that out a little bit. The whole thing starts with something called a model. This is your business logic and your data part of your application. He manages how the data is stored, how the data is accessed, and what operations can be performed on the data. That's his job. He doesn't know anything about how data is going to be displayed on the screen. And that's really important because then you can use this model in any type of system. You could use it in a, in a command line system. You could use it in a graphical user interface. You could use it in a web application. You could use it in web services. Doesn't matter how you want to use him, you're exposing everything. Go ahead and let somebody in there. <laughs> You're late. Anyway, uh, oh, two of you are late. Wow. Now I've quadrupled the attendance from the last time. So the model is the part that has the data collection, right? It, it keeps track of data and manipulating the data. The view is how you present that data to the user. Now I'm not necessarily talking about a view as just a graphical component. You notice a moment ago I talked about command line interfaces and I talked about web services, right? I think of those as views. A web service is nothing but a view. It shouldn't be smart. All it should be is a very thin layer on top of a model to present that model to the outside world. And that's really important whenever you work with web services because a lot of times people will create a web service and has all sorts of business logic in it. Don't do that. If you separate out this way, your model has all your business logic and you can put any kind of user interface in front of it any kind of exposure there. You could make it a web service, you could make it a graphical user interface. So the view presents the data to the user. Then the controller listens to the user and interprets their actions. So if you click on something, or if you start typing, or if you hit a command key, or if you touch the screen or drag or something, all of these interactions are interpreted by the controller part of your application, trying to figure out what you meant, what your intent was. Once it figures that out, it's going to perform some updates on the model. So if we look at it this way, the view goes to the model and says, gimme. And that's all he cares about from the model, is get data. He doesn't want to modify data. He just gets data to present it. The controller updates data. So that when the user does some interactions, if those interactions mean update, like I start typing, boom, I update the model. If the interactions don't mean an update, maybe they're just like a scroll bar change. Maybe all we're going to do is adjust that view, just reposition it on the screen for the user, so it might stay just down at that level. So those are kind of the main interactions between these two guys. Now, anytime that data is updated, the view is probably going to want to refresh, right? So what we do is we take advantage of the observer pattern, which we talked about last week, and the model will then tell the view in the controller that he's changed, if they're interested. They don't have to register for that if they don't want to. Like the controller, he may not care about the state of the model. But the view most definitely will, because anytime the data changes, he's going to want to go back to the model and get that data again. So it's very important that he can register the model and say, tell me when you've changed. When the view gets that notification, he's going to go back and get the data. User does some interaction. It updates the model. The model sends off that notification to the view and the controller. And the whole cycle starts again. Make sense? Questions so far? Separating things by these three pieces can buy you a whole lot in your application. If you change a view, what does it hurt? 
Does it affect your controller or your model? Not at all, right? You can manipulate stuff on the screen in your GUI, and you can't break your model that way. Your model is still going to work for any other views out there. You can add and remove views on the fly. Suppose you had a stock application, for example. Maybe you have a pie chart that represents the stocks. Maybe you have a table. Maybe you have a graph. All different visualizations. Or maybe you just have you know, a listing of a specific stock. All different visualizations on the same model data. Now, the thing that we are really uh, trying to stress here is this separation line in the middle between your business logic up here, your model, and your presentation or your user interface, the view and the controller. The presentation wants to access and mutate data, and that's all he's going to ask across that line. The model wants to notify changes, and that's all he's going to ask along that line. Note that that makes the model crazy flexible, right? He doesn't actually care who's using him. Anybody can use him at that point. Now, quite often what we'll do, the, the communication between the view and the controller is quite often a one-to-one -one situation. Think about a text field on the screen. It's pretty much the presentation of that data and the interaction of the user are really bound together in that one field on the screen. So quite often, you won't think of the view and controller as separate. Sometimes it'll give you an advantage to separate them out, but in practice, you really don't see a good reason to separate those two. So usually you'll just kind of lump them together and call them a user interface. How I present to the user and how I respond to the user interaction. This diagram here is meant to show that I can have any number of views, and I could actually have any number of controllers on that same model. I can add and remove these views at will, and it doesn't hurt anything. Remove the pie chart from the, the stock application, the bar graph and the table still work, right? So nice, nice interaction there. So we're going to start by a little example here. We're going to go back to the mediator example from the first class. And in this guy, I had defined this middle component called a mediator. And he's responsible for managing interaction between user interface components. I used to have this all kind of bundled up in one big glob as a main, just to hook things up and interact. And then we separated it out so that I have a reusable add button, a reusable remove button, and a reusable list component. And all the interaction logic was in that mediator. And that was a nice step in the right direction, but it wasn't enough. So if we go over here and take a look, I had defined my mediator here. And I'm just going to move things a little bit here as you can see them a little bit better. Uh, if you're not familiar with lambdas, if you go to javadude.com underneath articles, I have a video talking about lambdas in Java 8. Uh, most of the time, they should be fairly readable. So the action listener on the button, when the button's pressed, I'm just going to add an item to the list. When the remove button's pressed, I'm going to remove an item from the list. So that's all I'm doing there. And all the Lambda does here is say, here's my input, here's the action. And that represents the action listener that comes into here. But if you want to more, know more details, please go to javadude.com slash articles. So this mediator is dealing with that interaction. He's wiring things together. Take my add button, take my remove button, take my list, and take the text field. And inter talk about how they interact. And then my GUI is going to put things together. So I'm going to have a little frame with a, with a border layout. On the west, I have a list. In the center, I have the uh, little item field up at the top and the add and remove buttons. And then I'm just going to display that. So let me just run this just so you can see what it looks like. So really, really simple GUI here. I started with Java AWT just to keep things a little simpler. Later on, we're going to talk about Swing a bit. So inside here, I can push add an A. I can add B. I can add C. And I can remove things like that. So fairly simple interaction. But I still have a lot of things happening in that one mediator. So we want to try to separate things out. And you'll also notice that in that mediator, I'm actually storing things in that GUI component in the list. That means if I decide to change what my GUI looks like, instead of using a AWT list, if I use some other component, I have a chance of breaking my business logic, right? Because it's all baked together. Separating that out should buy me some stuff. So our next step is we're going to define a simple model. 
This is going to be a two-layer model. We're going to start with a to-do item, which is just going to have a descriptive text inside of it, and a to-do list, which is going to have a list of to-do items inside of it. So very, very simple model. Let's go over here and take a look at what he looks like. So here's my to-do item. He has a single description field, a getter and setter, nice simple stuff. And then I'm just having a hash code and equals to say I consider them equal if the description's equal. My to-do list, again, a very, very simple model class here. He has a list of items and ways to add and remove from them. So far, so good. Now let's make this a little bit more interesting. Let's set these models up so that outside people can know when things change. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the property change listener class we talked about in the last one. And as I, as I know, most of you weren't here in that last session. But again, look at that video, talk about how the observer pattern works, talk about how property changes work. And the idea is that any time a to-do item changes, so his descriptive text changes, we're going to notify anybody who's registered and said, I'm interested in you. In the to-do list, any time the list of items has changed, I'm going to notify the, uh, uh, anybody who's interested as well. Now note that list of items changed is just at the top level. So if an item is added or removed, I will notify. But if the contents of one of those items is changed, I'm not going to notify. We'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So just keep that in mind. So It depends on the part of the GUI. And we'll walk through an example where we can talk about how the nested things can kind of propagate the change events. And that can be very, very useful. So let's take a look there. And you'll now see that my to-do list got a little bit more complex. I added in this property change support guy, which is a little guy who takes care of managing the listeners. So anybody can add and remove property change support. They just say, hey, to-do list, add me as a property change listener. And if so, I will notify them by calling fire property change anytime an item is added or an item is removed. So that makes a nice communication scheme for them. My to-do item, very similar. At the top, I have that exact same property change support thing. I could have put it into a super class if I really wanted to. I'm not a fan of that, because as soon as you do that, you, you're saying, I'm extending something. So you've taken up your extension. And you're not really keeping that is a relationship that inheritance should be. You're really just having a convenient superclass to inherit some common functionality. So the property change support helps us there, and then we're delegating to it to do the job. So then when the description changes, grab the old description, change it, fire property change to say, OK, I've changed from the old value to the new value. That's all we've done in this one so far. Now let's take a look at adding on. Oops, actually, one, one thing I wanted to do. One caution here. If we take a look at the list, check out this get items method here. The get items method is returning the actual list of items that we're managing, right? So somebody outside of this could say get items dot add. And then we'll never know that it's changed, right? So we cannot notify people that the list of items has changed. That's very dangerous. And this is a common mistake that people make in a lot of applications like this, where you'll expose that list. And even though you have these add and remove, which you know you have the complete intention here of notifying people when the things are added and removed, you lose it if somebody goes around you by getting to the list directly. So what we can do is. one approach, create an unmodifiable list wrapper around this. And this unmodifiable list basically just lops off any of the mutating methods. If you try calling dot add, it throws an exception. Now, personally, that's a really, really bad way to do things, at least the way that Java defined unmodifiable list. The problem is that their list interface has the mutation methods in it. And I think this was a big design mistake they made in Java. You shouldn't, if you have a list, all you should care about the list is I have stuff in it and I can get stuff, right? A mutable list would allow you to change it. Well, the problem is they defined at their base list those mutation methods. And 
in the subclass unmodifiable list that they're creating here, they do what's called a refused bequest. They basically lop off the functionality that's in the superclass. Remember, whenever you have a superclass, all of your subclasses should be able to do the same things a superclass did, right? Well, in this case, we're denying some of the functionality. So not a great pattern, but it's one of our only choices in Java here, right? Now, we could do something much, much, much more insidious. We could create our own wrapper around this list. And I started to do that in the, the talk last week where I showed a bit of a wrapper going around. And what you'll do is this wrapper intercepts all the calls for add, remove, set, various things like that. And on each of those calls, it will check to see uh, the user's made a change to the list, fire a change notification. So you can do that. It can be very, very tricky, especially when you get down to things like, well, what do I do when I get an iterator on a list? because the iterators on a list have a remove method, which can modify it. So I need to wrap the iterator. So it becomes this big wrapping mess. So at least for purposes of this example, we're just going to go with collections on modifiable list just to cut off the possibility that somebody can actually modify the list without us knowing. Now, as long as they call our add and remove down there, we know they've changed. We fire the property change event. So the next thing we're going to do is start adding in a view. And I'm going to start at the to-do item level. I'm going to take that to-do item and I'm going to create a to-do view. Inside that to-do view class, who's, he's going to be a panel that just has a text field inside of him. He's going to have two property change listeners. One is going to listen to the to-do item that's our model. So somebody says, hey, view on the screen, here's your model. And he hooks them up. We're going to listen to them, and any time that that model changes, we're going to get the description from the model. We're going to call set text on the text field to put the field text in the field. Pretty simple, right? We're going to have a different listener over here that listens to the text field for changes with the user typing into it. Anytime that text field changes, we're going to get the text from the text field and set the description in the model. So now we have two-way communication. Now, we're obviously going to want to guard on both ends here to say, if my value hasn't really changed, don't set the other guy. Otherwise, we get these infinite cycles, which just aren't cool. So let's take a look at him. And we're setting up our little GUI here. Note that I'm not changing these guys up here right now. And this and ignore the naive guy. He's going to go away in a couple of steps here. So the UE here, here's our to-do view. And he's going to set up a little border layout for himself and put the item field at the top. Now, I didn't need to wrap this. I could have just directly had a text field here. But I wanted to set myself up for a little bit more complex to do item where I add a priority in later on. So I'm just wrapping it in a panel with a text field inside of it. So when I'm setting up the GUI, I say, hey, item field, whenever your text changes, if I don't have a model, forget it. I'm not hooked up to anybody. Otherwise, set the description to the text from the text field. So exactly what we said we're going to do, right? Now here's a pattern that you're going to see in pretty much every set model. Anytime you're setting a model in your view, you pass the model in, and that model might be null, it might not be null, right? The first thing we want to check is to say, were we currently hooked up to a model? If so, disconnect. And that's a really important step. If you don't do that, you're going to leave these listeners hooked up to old models. And you really don't want to do that because if the model changes, then your GUI starts changing. So you want to make sure you disconnect that. So if I had a model, remove the listener that was listening to it. Then I'm going to set my model. And then if the current model's not null, hook up my listener. Fairly simple, right? And then what you want to do is an initial setup of the UE fields on the screen. So I'm going to get data from the model and put it into the fields. Pretty simple stuff. And let's look at our listener up here. Here's our property change listener. We're going to be listening to that, that model class. And I'm going to say if the text field already has the right text, skip it. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to update that text on the screen. Uh, otherwise, go ahead and set the text to the description from the item. So I'll just set that text field on the screen. So that's all this guy is doing, a very simple little class here, very, very single-minded. I'm going to display and manage a single to-do item on the screen. Now to test him out, 
I created a little UE test class here. And what I'm going to do in here is create four of those to-do views. But I'm only going to have one item <coughs> on the screen there. So this one item should be displayed in all four of those guys because I'm setting the model to that same item on every one of these guys. I'm just going to put them in a little view with a grid layout just so there's four of them stacked on top of each other. And let's try running this. So here are my four text fields. If I type in the first field, you'll see that all the other fields are being updated. Now what's going on here? Whenever I type in that field, I'm getting that change notification. I go and update my model. The model then fires the change notifications to anybody who's interested, which are all four of those fields. And then we pull the text and put it in the field. Make sense? Now what's going to happen if I do this? So I've created, make sure I didn't pull that out there. I've created two models now. And now two of the fields are using one model, two of the fields are using another model. What do you think is going to happen on this? Any ideas? What will happen if I change this first text field? Okay, so let's go ahead and type in hello and we'll see that that happens there, right? What happens if I change the second text field? Same thing, right? Boom, just like that. And if I change the third one, the third and fourth both change. So as long as they're both hooked up to the same model, the user, the user interface interacts with them, right? This is where you start to see some of the power of this. Now, in this case, we're using the exact same view class for all four of these. But we could have had different types of view classes. Imagine, again, the, the stock application one, where you have a pie chart and a graph and a table. Each of these connected to that same model and you can mix and match them however you want. You could use two different models where a pie chart and a graph has one model and a table has another. You could have two different models where they both have all three of those guys. You can start to mix and match these any way you want to. That's where things start to really get cool. Okay, let's go back over here. So our next step is to get a little more complicated here. It's going to look a lot more complicated, but it's really not that much more complicated. We're going to nest our GUI. We're going to have a top-level GUI that represents the entire to-do list. That's going to have inside of it a to-do view with a text field, right? And a list that corresponds to all the items in the to-do list. We're going to manage that to-do list by saying anytime he changes, find out which item was selected in the list, get that item from my to-do list model, and then set that as the model to my to-do view. So you click on something, we update the little to-do view that we just dealt with, right? Anytime the model has a property change, what we're going to do, and this is a really, really crude way to do it just because AWT isn't very fun to play with, but what we're going to do is we're going to completely clear that list. Then we're going to get all the items out of the, the to-do list model and just add the descriptions to that list. So you're just putting the text inside the list. So that down here when we do the selection change, we say which number was selected, get the real item, and plug it into the to-do view. Then we have our add and remove button. When the add button is pressed, I'm just going to create a brand new to-do item, add it to my to-do list, I forgot to put that in there, and then set that as the model. Boom, I'm editing it. If remove is pressed, I'm going to take whatever is selected, find out what the item is, and remove it from the item. Remove it from the model. So that's the logic behind this guy. Let's take a look at the code. So first thing, I modified my to-do item slightly. I added in a priority field just to make him a little bit more interesting. So same as before, I just added priority and priority acts exactly the same way as description did. It's just another text field. This way, instead of, I would have put it as a number, but sometimes people like to say P1 or ABC for priority. So I decided I'd make it a string. What the heck? <coughs> and my to do view is a little bit more complex, not too much. I now have two fields. So when I set up my GUI, I'm adding both of those fields at the center of it there. 
But I made the center a little bit more complex. He has two columns. One column has labels, description, priority, one that has the text fields, just so it looks like a form. And then I created this update fields method, which says I'm going to update the uh, to description field on the screen with the description property and the priority field on the screen with the model priority. And that just does the same logic we had before. If it already has the value, don't set it. If it doesn't have the value, set it on the screen. Whenever the model changes, update the fields. When I'm setting the model, same type of thing as before. The only difference is here is I'm going to say when, if I've been set to a model that exists, update my fields. That's my initialization that I did before. And I added in a little something here just to be a little nice user-wise. I'm enabling or disabling the fields based on if I have a model. This way, when the thing first comes up, I can't type in those fields and it has a bogus model behind the scenes. It just makes it a little bit nicer for the user. So that's my to-do view. He's OK as that. To-do list view, a little bit more complex. My model is a to-do list. I'm going to have a little refresh list method here. This is the, the code I was talking about where I remove everything from that list, and then I just add the descriptions to the list. When I set my model, again, disconnect if I had a model. Set my model. If I have a new model, connect and populate the UE. Same approach as I've done every single time here. When I'm setting up my GUI here, I create my list, and I add a listener to the list if an item is selected, then I'm going to set the model on the to-do view. That's the individual view for the one to-do guy. And he's going to be look up the appropriate item. Again, it's AWT. It's a little messy there. This will get simpler when we switch over to Swing. Now my to-do view, I create an instance of him. Create an instance of my add and remove buttons. If add is pressed, create a new item, set it, or add it to my model select that new item in the list, and then set my model on my to-do view to that new item. If I'm removing, look the guy up and remove it. And then just set up my GUI on the screen. So let's see what this looks like. Here's my uh, setup code. I'm just creating an a single to-do list, top-level model, create a view for him, hook him up, and then add him to the GUI. So a very simple little little runner here. So here's my GUI here. This thing up here is my uh, to-do view. So that's for one single to-do. The overall thing is my to-do list view. So I'm going to hit Add. These guys become active. If I start typing, he's added in. Now you're going to notice something happening here. I'm not seeing any updates over here unless I push add, right? Now, if I select things, you're going to see the right values there. Notice even the blank one here has this. The reason this is happening is I'm not doing that nested change notification. So I'm not saying when the description changes, propagate that up to say something in the list has changed. So my overall GUI doesn't know there was a change. And he doesn't refresh that list. We'll fix that in a minute. Okay, but it seems to be doing what we wanted it to do, right? So now we're going to do some nested property changes. And this is actually a pretty simple thing to do, but you've got to think real carefully if you want to do it, because this can go crazy deep if you're not careful, if you have a large data structure. So what we're going to do is in my to-do list, anytime I have a to-do item added, I'm going to listen to it. Anytime there's a change to that item, I'm going to treat it as though my items property has changed. And I'm going to fire that property change listener. Anytime an item's added or removed, I fire a property change listener. This sets it up now so that anybody listening to that to-do list will know that the list of items has changed or the contents of any of those items has changed. Okay, and this is something you may want to do, something you might not want to do. It depends on your design. So let's check him out here. I removed my little naive GUI from this now. And let's take a look at our to-do list. <clears throat> Same setup for property change support up here. 
oh, that caution isn't needed anymore because I put the unmodifiable list in there. And notice that the add and remove got a little more complex. So what I'm doing is I'm saying I add the item to my list, and then I add a property change listener to it. And then I fire my change there. My item listener just says, when I've been notified, fire property change for the overall items list. So it just delegates that. It propagates that change notification. And that's the only change I made there. So let's take a look at our UE test now and see what happens. I'm going to push add. Now, one thing I did with this new item, I did make one of the little tweak I forgot about, is inside he, is it the to-do item? No, I didn't do it in to-do item. I did it in the to-do list view. Yeah, in this particular example here, I explicitly set the description to new item just so it's visible and doesn't show up as a blank field. So I can add a few new items there. Notice that it's changing over in the list now. And I can set the priorities. And as I move between them, everything seems to be working out just fine. Any questions so far? Making some sense? So now let's mix it up a little bit just to see what happens when we throw multiple views and models into things. I'm going to set up my structure to look like this. I'm going to create three to-do list views and two models. The first two views are going to share the same model. So we should see anything done in one changes the other, right? The other one is going to have his own independent model. So let's see how that looks. Oh, I missed the convert to swing step. Oh, my step numbers are out of sync there. Ah! So this was a version here where I just converted everything to swing, and things get a little bit simpler. Swing uses model view controller very heavily at its base. So everything, like a text field, has a model behind it. They call it a document. A uh, list has a model behind it. And that makes it really easy to set things up here. So let's first of all take a look at what the list does. I knew I missed a step when I did the slides. Uh, I'm going to set up a to-do list model. This is what a swing list looks at to describe what goes on the screen. I'm creating what's known as an adapter here. This is going to be an abstract list model from swing who has two methods get element at, and get size. This allows the swings list to say, hey, how many elements are there? Give me the first one, give me the second one, give me the third one, give me the fourth one. And then he displays those on the screen. Nice and simple, right? I'm taking advantage of this abstract list model to override those two guys in terms of my to-do list. So how many items are there, swing asks. He calls this method. I interpret that as get the items and tell me how many are there. Get me the nth item. I say get my items and get the nth item out of it. Pretty simple adaptation there. We'll talk more about the adapter pattern in a later session. And then set model. Once again, that same type of pattern. If I had one, stop listening to it, set the, lit, set the model, and then uh, if I have a new model, start listening to it. Fire contents change will tell the list on the screen that something's changed. This listener up here, when I'm listening to the items in the list, I'm going to call fire contents change as well. So if the list changes, the J list on the screen should change as well. Now for each item on the screen, by default, it goes to the object and says to string to, to figure out what goes in the list on the screen. That's not a great way to display things. Because toString is really intended as a debugging aid. It's really not intended as the representation as item on the screen. Think about that for a second. I have my model. I can use it anywhere I want. Command line interface, a web service, a GUI, web, uh, web application, whatever I want. Do I necessarily want to display things the same way in all those? By implementing toString, I'm defining the one true way to display it, right? And that's kind of silly. If you have different interfaces, different ways of displaying it, there is no one true way of displaying things. 
this is where kind of some of the object-oriented purists, their heads start to explode. Because they're like, the object should do everything itself. Well, if the object does everything for itself, then you only ever have one way of displaying something, right? And that's not good. So what Swing does is they allow you to define something called a renderer. And what this does is it generates a rubber stamp. You know, if you think about, you know, you, you call the rubber stamp lady or whatever the, the company is online to make your own custom rubber stamps, you get one of these stamps and you go, boom, stamp it down, and you have an image on the screen, right? What a renderer does is create a rubber stamp for you. So you get passed in the value that you want to display, and it creates a label. I'm putting some text in that label, in this case, the description, and then the priority in parentheses, and then I return the label. The J list prints that on the screen. So it's not really an interactive component. It's just an image that it draws on the screen using that label as a rubber stamp. So by defining this, I'm going to display each item by saying description and the priority in parentheses. Now my to-do view is very, very similar in Swing as it was from AWT. It's a, it's a hair simpler, uh, but it's almost exactly the same thing. So model setup, same as before. Enabling, disabling, updating fields, all that type of stuff. Instead of using text fields, I'm now using J text field and J panel and J label. The GUI setup, almost identical. Unfortunately, in Swing, listening to the document of a, of a text field is a little bit more complex. There's actually three methods here, so I couldn't directly use a lambda. Lambdas only work if you have an uh, interface that has one method inside of it. So what I did is I had to set up this little listen method here, this is just to help myself out here, that says anytime one of these change notifications happens, call this common changed method. And I can pass in a lambda here, which is no argument, and then set the description, no argument, set the priority. And I'm passing him in as a runnable so that any time some change happens, I'm just going to call run on it. Now you'll note that I have, actually this is this version is not correct. Let me put this in here. Oops. I, ugh. This is what I get for using one keyboard all day, and now I'm using my laptop keyboard. So now you'll note that I have put in here Swing Utilities Invoke Later. What this does is it pushes this runnable onto the stack of things to do in the, in the user interface thread. The user interface thread, there's a single thread running. Anytime the user interacts with the GUI, that action is handled by that user interface thread that action ends up invoking these methods, these change notifications. And what this means is that the model has been changed, but the GUI on the screen hasn't changed the display. So we want to wait to make sure that the GUI on the screen is up to sync. So what we're going to do is we're going to push this runnable on a little to-do list inside the GUI thread. And the next time the GUI thread has a chance, it's going to run this thing for us. That releases control here so that the GUI thread can finish the update cycle that it's going through. And this is real important in this particular example. Um, you can get some very weird results out of this, and sometimes you get an exception saying that you were trying to modify during a notification. So we just want to take that, set it aside, and say, do this as soon as you get a chance. And then whatever that runnable is, which is setting the description of the model, we'll do a little bit later. Okay. We could also have pushed that off to a different thread if we really wanted to. Okay. But in this particular case, because I'm calling get text on the field, I want to make sure that happens in the user interface thread so that everything's in sync. Now the to-do list view, he gets actually quite a bit simpler. My model setup, same type of thing as before, but you'll notice that there's no special code here to populate the user interface. That's being handled by that list model. Anytime the list changes, it updates the list on the screen automatically. We don't need to worry about that anymore. Swing's taking care of that for us. So all I'm doing is the connect and disconnect thing here. When I'm setting up my GUI, I'm going to create my model. This is the, um, 
the real to-do list model. So the whoop, actually, yeah, this this is the adapter here, that list model guy. I'm going to plug it in to the J list that I'm creating. I'm going to create a renderer, which is that rubber stamp guy. Plug him into the list. I'm going to say whenever the list changes, set the model on the to-do view. Pretty simple. And then, where was the... Where did I have that code? Ah, here we go. So when we're setting the model, all I'm doing is plugging that model in to the to-do list model, to that adapter. So I change the target of that adapter every time I change my model. And then that will allow it to update the list on the screen, and life is peachy. And that's it for this guy. All he's doing is wiring up the GUI components, creating that uh, list model, and then changing the actual real model inside the list model whenever it changes. So if I run this guy now, it looks a little different because now it's a swing application. If I say add, now right now the list doesn't have any items in it, so he kind of collapses to nothing. Now it'd probably be nice if I set it up so he has a minimum size so that he actually shows up. But when I hit add, he'll pop in there. He has a description in the one. If I change that, he changes there. Change that guy. Add a few other guys here. and so on. And so you see that it's all now interacting just nicely for us. Yes? So the mm -hmm. Yeah, you could actually have a picture on there. So typically with a picture, you get that J label coming in there, and you can just set the icon inside the J label. I'm trying to remember what the, the name of it is, because I've, I've been doing Android lately, and it's compound drawables, but in, in Swing there's a way to say set the icon that goes on it and it can go either before or after or above or below the text. Or you could actually have a much more complex component. You could have a whole panel that has stuff inside of it. Just keep in mind that that's not live. It's actually just an image being displayed. Now you can interact with it for editing. There's a special way of, when you click on it, it converts into an editor for you. That's much more complex. Okay, so that's that guy. Now back on to that multiple views idea. Is that, that clock isn't working over there, is it? Oh, no, I guess it is. Okay. So let's switch over to this guy. So now in the, the, in the UE test here, I'm hooking up that multiple views and multiple models thing here. So I'm creating two models, to-do list one and to-do list two, creating three views using the same model in the first two, using a different model on the, on the third one. I'm just putting those into a grid layout on the screen. Let's see what that looks like. Now this probably isn't a GUI that you'd want to actually create using the same view three different times that way. Maybe it is. Maybe there's some reason for it. I don't know. I'm not going to judge. So now when I hit add, notice that the first two change because they're both using the same model. When I hit add down here, just this third one changes. Ooh, I have got some kind of bug in there. Oh, that's that attempt to mutate notification I talked about. Apparently in this version of it, I hadn't made that swing utilities invoke later change. And where was that one again? It was this one here. And let me kill that guy and run him again. That should fix that problem. And there we go, just, just fine there. Okay, questions so far? Now keep in mind, these could have been different types of views. They don't have to be the same copy of the view. 
but I could add and remove them at will. I could even add and remove those views at runtime, right? I could put some little buttons down here saying, add another view, add another view, remove the first view, something like that, whatever I wanted to do. Okay, and let's go back over here. And now let's take a look at the idea of a selection model. Now, one thing you'll, you'll notice in that previous example, let me actually bring them back up one more time. Each of these lists has their own idea of what's selected. So they all select independently of each other. Now, that might be what you want. It might not be what you want. By default, each of these guys keeps track of the selection just by themselves. But what I can do, I can add something called a co-model. It's another model that runs along with our main model up here to keep track of selection. So here's what I'm going to set up in this example. I'm going to have now four of these views on the screen, just to make things really annoying. And the first two are going to share the same selection model. This guy's going to have his own selection model, and this guy's going to have his own selection model. And what this selection model does, he keeps track of what's selected in the list, and he is a model. So if you select something in this list, it says set selection. He fires off change notifications. Both lists will update their selection on the screen. Works very similar to this guy up here. So if I go back over here, and we will say check out. And let's take a look at our to-do list model. Oops, to-do list view, that's what I wanted. He now adds in this whole selection model idea. So when I create a to-do list view, I can pass in a selection model. And if it's not null, I'm just going to set that as a selection model for the list. This allows me to create a selection model and pass it in and use the same one for multiple views. So in my test class over here, I'm going to create an, an instance of a selection model. Oh, I should also point out that I have this version of this single constructor that doesn't have any arguments, is just passing a null in for me as a convenience. So this guy will say, create two to-do lists. Those are my two models. Create a selection model. Create two views that use the same selection model. Create two other views that have their own selection models. And then set the models up. The first three have the first, first model. This guy has the other model. And so now if I run this guy, I see four of these on the screen. I'm going to hit Add. We're going to see the same models being shared, right? Now note that these first two lists are now sharing a selection model. Okay, so that's a co-model. And you don't have to use Swing to do this. You can have your own classes, your own view classes, share models and share multiple models if you want to. And then this guy down here, he has his own selection, and this guy has his own selection. Make sense? So it really depends on how you want to go about it. This actually is kind of nice because instead of having to have some outsider control the selection stuff and listen to each of the selections and call set on them, you're basically just saying, let him manage that for me, plug it in once, and I'm done. And so it's more of a wiring exercise than a setting up listeners explicitly. So it's a nice approach to doing it. Now, if you don't have that ability, like if these guys didn't allow you to do that, then you could track it outside. So like if it was using AWT, for example, I could add a listener of my own saying, when a selection changes, change it here and here. And then that'll allow us to keep them in sync as well. Oops. So there's one more that I had here. And this was just, I was making a little tweak to this to add in a status bar. So I'm throwing in a new type of view on this. Now the status bar, I decided to have two models I'm going to listen to. I'm going to listen to the currently selected item, and I'm going to listen to my overall list. So on my status bar, I can have it say, item foo selected, and then tell you how many priority one items there are. So that's what I wanted to do with my status, status bar here. I could also say how many total items there are if I wanted to. So listener, update my field, same as before. I can get my models. 
update field is just going to display change what the text is that's displayed. So first of all, if I don't have an item, I'm going to say nothing selected. Otherwise, I'm going to say which item selected. If I have a list, I'm going to go through and just count how many priority one items there are. Now, because I have it as a string, I have to do a string comparison on this. So I'm just going to trim it and check to see if it's one. Um, as I said, it was 4 a.m. when I was writing this and I got tired, so I said screw it. Uh, so I'm going to walk through the list. And every time I see a one, I'm just going to keep track of it and then tack on at the end how many number one priority items there are. For setting my item, do that same pattern. If I had one, remove, uh, disconnect from it, set it. If I now have one, listen to it and update the field on the screen. Okay. And I just realized what I should really be doing, this is kind of silly, whoops, my update field should really be outside of that if, right? Because if I have a null item, I want to clear the previous entry. So actually, I made a little bit of a mistake along the way here. I should have had that outside. Yeah, note to self, do not do stuff like this when you're tired. Set list, same type of thing. Going to add my listeners. Boom. So basically, anytime the list changes or a specific item changes, update that text at the bottom of the screen. I'm just going to leave that as it was for the moment. Let's, his setup is all the same on here. The difference is in my to-do list view, I'm going to create a status bar. And then if the list selection changes, I'm going to set that to be the item in the status bar. If I remove things, I'm going to set the item to the selected value. And then I'm just going to add them at the bottom of the GUI. So now we'll see here, nothing is selected, zero priority, one items. I'm going to add a few here. Notice that he's counting how many priority one items because my to-do item, I default it to one anytime you create something. If I change his priority, this guy changes here. And so on. And then down here I can add, he's using a different model, so we get a different count on that. So now we're really using a different kind of view this particular view is looking at multiple models. So you get some interesting things out of that. Okay, any questions on that? So this is this has kind of started to, to get into some of the detail on what this pattern can buy you. It really gives you a lot of separation and where I think it really shines, and one of the things I want to stress, if you're doing web services, which is kind of one of the hot things now, make sure you treat your web service as a user interface. Don't treat it as model code. Don't treat it as business logic. Keep your business logic in your model and you can share that same logic across web applications, GUIs, web services, command line interfaces, whatever way you're presenting stuff to the user. That's really, really key. All your web service should do is get the data coming in, figure out what it means, and then talk to the model to do things. That's it. When data is coming out, get the data from the model, format it however you want, JSON, whatever. Send it back down to the user. That's going to make your life with web services so much easier. And now you have a reusable model you can do anywhere. And I've used stuff like this where I have the exact same model on a server for web services and on an Android application for managing a GUI. And that buys you a whole lot because you can reuse that code like crazy. Um, and uh, it really makes the web services so much simpler. Okay, any questions? Ah, validation. Now, that depends. Okay, there's a couple, couple approaches to validation. One is whenever you're making a change, so when you're calling a set, do your validation there, and then don't set the field. And I don't like that approach. What you really want to do is have something in your your model at the top level, like a top level validate method, and have a dirty have a flag that says, "Am I valid or am I not valid?" Any time this is changed, you rerun your validation and just mark things as valid or invalid. And usually, I'll keep like a list of here's the errors I currently have, and the the uh, user interface can then go back to the model and say, "What are the current errors?" and display it and are you valid or not? 
And based on that, the user interface may let you continue on to somewhere else or might force you to stay where you are. But then you can also highlight fields red if there's any errors for them. So you may want to have a map that keeps track of here are the errors for a given field and key that by some kind of a field key. Uh, usually what I'd, I'd do is have like the, the property name. So you'd have like the property name priority as your key and then a list of errors. The errors might just be strings. They might be more complex objects to keep track of the errors, something like that. Um, but uh, one of the things early in Java that they did is they added this idea in called vetoable changes. So you could add a listener. They called them constrained properties. You could add a listener that said, before I actually set this, instead of using property change support, you had vetoable change support. So you'd fire a vetoable change just before the priority, the, the value was set here, and the listener had a chance to throw an exception and actually stop the change. The problem is you never got to see what the bad value was. <laughs> that gets lost in the process because you're not setting it. So I'd much rather just have a flag saying, I'm invalid, revalidate every time I change, and then outsiders can check, are you valid or not, with the appropriate messages. Make some sense? Yeah, validation is not an easy thing to get, to get right. It can be very, very tricky, especially when you have to deal with nested objects, like your to-do list. You're going to want to watch for the validation of each of your nested guys. So when somebody says, are you valid, check my top level for validity, and then check the guys I own for validity as well. Okay, that would actually be a good topic for me to do talk on at some point. You know, walk through some examples of here's how you can do some validation. I'll see if I can squeeze it in somewhere. Any other questions? How do you deal with like the database and then objects following the database? Like change both of them at the same time? So the question is how do you deal with a database and objects modeling that the uh, object representing the stuff in that database? Um, do you change them both at the same time or do you change them independently? Um, I'm going to throw a big that depends at that. Uh, one thing I did recently on Android is I set up some shell objects that had actually no data fields in them at all. And every one of the getters and setters wrote to the database. It actually changed fields in the database directly, which when I tried it at first, I thought it was going to be crazy slow. It actually performs really, really well, um, at least on, on somewhat newish hardware. Um, and so I left it. And what that bought me in that particular example is as the user makes changes, boom, it's persisted to the database. If there's a bug and something crashes, all your changes up to that point have been saved. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, one of the things that that is a little dangerous for is when you make a change, the change is there. The user didn't have a chance to make some changes and say, OK. I mean, the big advantage there is you don't have to have an OK button, right? You don't have to have a save button. Things are saved as you do them. Um, but the user doesn't have to say, have a chance to say, ooh, I didn't like that. So I implemented undo in the application. So every change that I made is also tracked so I can undo the change. And that took care of it really nicely. So now the user doesn't even really have to think. They just change fields on the screen, select a different item, change some fields on the screen, select a different item, and so on. Everything's peachy. Um, now, if you can't do an undo or don't want to do an undo, and undo is pretty simple. That's next week's session. I'm going to talk about the command pattern and that talks about how to do undo. And it's actually crazy simple to do. Um, as long as you break things down to the right level, it is really simple. Um, but if you don't want to do undo, then you're going to want that option of the save and the, and the cancel button. And at that point, it requires you to keep track of the changes before you write them to the database. And your OK button is just going to say, take all my objects and boom, dump them all out at once. Now, that can perform better. It depends on the system you're using. Um, this is a server system that I'm working on right now. And the people who started setting it up used Hibernate. And so they're using Hibernate to automatically map between databases and objects, which sounds like a great idea. <coughs> but anytime something goes wrong and you have to debug that mess, I mean, it, it's vicious. Because you get these stack traces that are like 40 methods deep and trying to figure out, well, what does that error mean? Especially if there happens to be a bug in Hibernate under the covers then you're really hosed. Uh, and so it's one of those things that I've, I've banged my head against the desk several times because of. It can be something, if you have a very simple data model, it can be easy to set up. But as your data model grows, it can be a real nightmare to maintain. 
Um, but it has the advantage of automating that for you. You can basically just say, save these objects, and it persists them all for you automatically, um, as opposed to you having to walk through and then figure out the right squeal statements to actually update the database. And by the way, SQL is pronounced squeal. I was told that by a very reliable source who is a comedian. But anyway, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's one of those things, it's very much a depend situation. I've done it both ways. Sometimes it's it's useful one way, sometimes it's not. And it, it can affect your design and your application very significantly. Other questions? And I should also note that uh, typically I consider that a separate layer, a persistence layer. When people first start doing model view controller, they bake that into their model. And a better approach is to separate that out into a CRUD layer, where you have your create, read, update, and delete operations, so that your model stays just management of the data. And when you say persist, it goes off to the, the persistence layer to persist it. Now, there may be some, like, you know, like I did on that Android one, there may be a little bit of automatic communication between the two. So like in my Android model classes, all the getters and setters call the persistence layer to directly do their, their gets, their, their saves and their reads from the database. Um, but I did still treat it as a separate layer. It's much easier to manage that way. Okay, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Depends. <laughs> Uh, and part of it depends on do you want to store invalid data or not. And I tend to like to, whatever the user's typed in, store it, but just mark it invalid, as opposed to just saying, oh, I'm not going to bother persisting that to the database. Um, and then that way somebody else who's reading the data can see, oh, there's invalid data here, but maybe the user was in the middle of something. You know, maybe they were working with the application and had to go to lunch. Or you know, maybe they were called off to do something else. And I want to make sure the data is saved. But I, I still want to make sure that it's going to get dealt with as invalid data. So I generally prefer to put go ahead and put invalid data in, but make it really clear it's invalid. You know, have some kind of flag or some kind of algorithm on it. Okay, any other questions? But yes, yeah, some people don't like to do that. They prefer to have the user interface capture that and say, don't persist it yet. And just ghost out that save button. You know, in the case of the Android application, I didn't have that choice because I didn't have a save button. Everything's in the database directly. Okay. Other questions? Okay, well, thanks for all coming. Um, if you want to see the video of this at some point, javadude.com slash articles slash patterns. And I'll be putting it up very shortly. Uh, hope to see you all next month. <laughs>